Heavenly Father, what an amazing topic to discuss. Father, I'm not worthy to discuss it. You've called, Father, and I've answered. So I bring my nothingness. I pray, Father, that you will lead and guide this message. That you will open before us a true condition. <clears throat> Lord, you know each and every person in this room that's going to hear this message. May be tailored. May it be what we need. May it bring reformation in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> you want to open your Bibles and turn to Luke, the book of Luke, with me, please. Chapter 21. As good Bible students, we know and understand that there are a few chapters in the Bible that really bring it home regarding the signs of Jesus' return. The yeah. end. Luke 21 happens to be one of those chapters. You can easily point anybody, non Bible student, and say, hey, look at Luke chapter 21. Read that through. <coughs> And see what you think regarding life now. And in Luke chapter 21, I just want us to look at this one verse to start with. Verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unaware. Thirty-five. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, unawares. <clears throat> my week's been crazy. In fact, I think my life's been crazy lately. <clears throat> I've had things revealed to me that I didn't care to know. Family, friends, myself. We're all getting caught up. You know, there's been times where I've sat and pondered the end times. When I was in the rural fires, the end times. The old question always comes, when do you not turn out? Saturday's always a hot topic for an Adventist. When do you not turn out? And I used to think to myself that when that end time comes, there will be fires everywhere. And how could you resist the plea and the needs of our fellow man and not turn out? But we're also told to flee. And so we have to be in tune with God and where history is for the earth as to know what the time is. There will come a time when we will know forbearance for the man, sorry, forbearance for man's salvation has been exceeded. That it is, sorry, he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And so we think to ourselves, well, I used to think to myself that, you know, I'll understand and I'll know that time. Or will I? There have been fires raging around our neighbourhood for several weeks now. Was it nine, you said, Zach? Could have been nine weeks. Yeah. Nine weeks. Yeah. Is it that time? Yeah. <clears throat> I think God is trying to prepare us for some, something very big. The devil, I believe, is working hard to bring about his new policy. His new policy, climate change. It's on his it's on his to-do list. We've got to fix his earth, all right? He's uh, done a great job of getting us human beings to wreck it, and now he thinks that he can present a solution 
and we'll take it. Sadly, we're going. The majority of the world is going to fall into that category <coughs> of hook, line, and sinker. Because the reality is, everybody's starting to realise something needs to be done. Despite all the alarmists and all the hype that probably isn't even 10% true, the facts still are around us, are they not? Mm -hmm. We have a water carding business, not advertising. But we've been busy. Why? Because it's dry. Mm -hmm. There are places shutting down. You can't get water out of Canada now. And yet other places like Rath Downey, what is it? Pumping water out for wool. The dams that are supplying them are fast drying up and yet they're saying, no, 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 it's all right, we've got plenty. We've got plenty. <clears throat> Not even looking to impose forms of restrictions. There are more farmers in the Rath Downey district irrigating than I've ever seen that couldn't be bothered for irrigating simply because, why would you? It's too hard to earn a dollar. But guess what? The good old dollar motivates. Mm -hmm. Right now, you've got a shed full of hay, you might as well be a millionaire. Mm -hmm. If you've got a paddock full of fat cattle, you might as well be a millionaire too. Although that one's starting to take a down turn. Mm. I want to turn to Ezekiel. There's a message for mm. us mm. in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36, and I thought it was interesting, it was mentioned this morning, Ezekiel chapter 8, was it Chris? Right, yeah. I was reading through those this morning. That's a powerful message in itself. I preached a sermon on that one once before. That was the end of my preaching from that particular church for some time. I didn't like to hear that one. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 36, and we're going to start with verse 32. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do thi not this, sorry, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. Verse 23. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Israel, are we Israel? Mm -hmm. Have we been sanctified? Have we bore a witness to the heathen around us of God's holy name? But he said he's going to do this work. And that I see as a promise I want to hang on to. Because I know just how far I am from the mark. Every time I look at the life of Jesus, it just fills me with more... Nothingness. There's just no way you can measure up to that life. It's so wonderful. And yet it's that which we need in us, isn't it? It's that which will sanctify us. For I will take you from among the heathens and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Consider that one. Filthiness and idols. Search your hearts. What is it in your life that might be keeping you from being cleansed? A new heart. Amen. Also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Stone or flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Amen. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. 
And ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all, from your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. That almost sounds impossible right now, doesn't it? I had a man was sharing with me recently, he said he planted corn. Got about that eye, he said. And that's all it could muster, because it's just so dry. And he's so short of water. But God wants to increase. He wants to bless us abundantly, doesn't he? What he needs from us is our heart. Not because it's any use to him. He wants to throw it away. So he can give us a new one. He wants to take the spirit of pride and selfishness and throw that away. So he can put in us a new one. A right one. One that will glorify his name. One that will make the heathen take notice. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree. That one would be real nice right now, wouldn't it? And the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Now, if you take that verse and look at it carefully, if you're suffering right now, as we are as a people, perhaps there's a reason for it. Because we're not consecrated to the Lord. We're not fulfilling His purpose for us. And I'm not talking about going out and sharing the three angels' message in telling everybody what that says and what that means. I'm talking about sharing Jesus practically in your life. That's what the gospel is. A consecrated life will do more to show someone the love and mercy of God than any Bible study you can give without it. I said without because we don't want to chuck the baby out with the bathwater, right? There's nothing wrong with Bible studies, but with the heart being unconsecrated, it will just be a stench. It will yield very little. Doesn't mean it won't yield. Then shall ye, that's us, remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves. That's how I started to feel this morning. When I was considering my ways after reading Ezekiel 8, 9, and 10. And your doings that were not good, <laughs> and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. God's people. He wants to he wants to break from us <clears throat> this this chain that binds us to these things that we seem to think are far more important than his ways. I've heard it said a number of times, no one's going to tell me what to do. From Adventist people. Doesn't sound like a heart surrendered to God. Or no one's going to tell me I can't do that thing. Why? Because they love it. But I'm no different. I'm a sinner like the rest of us. And when I was searched this morning in prayer and study of the Word, Less abominable. <coughs> but God says it's not for our sakes. Mm. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. God is not playing games. He didn't go to the cross to leave it half done. And I was only saying this week the proof of God's love 
for men fallen and sinful and degraded as we are is the cross. <coughs> Why would you bother otherwise? To prove that he's so good? I'm sure that has its part, but the point is, it was because he loves us. He wants to save us. He wants to get through to us that we don't need sin to enjoy life. But because without God you have no life. You're on borrowed time. Last Sunday, we were heading out to go to a restaurant, for lack of a better word, a venue in which to get a nice meal. We're going to have a lovely <coughs> lunch, dinner, whatever you want to call it, to celebrate. <clears throat> and we were going to celebrate the fact that my two daughters, one has finished year 12 and the other one's finished year 10, homeschooled. Mm-hmm. Now, that works a lot of the time, homeschooling for a few years and then people start to fear their children's education. That's what we found anyway in our experience. I'm not knocking schooling systems outside of home and I'm not promoting that homeschooling has to happen. But you know what? When we began to homeschool, the people that were influencing us and telling us how wonderful and important it was and the way it weighed on my wife's heart for many days, months, could have even been a year. It was a long time. We could not deny the fact that that's what we needed to do for our children. Those very same people fell by and sent their children to public schools. Sometimes they tried Christian schools to find no better avail, although it it was no advantage. It just cost you more. You can feel better about it then. Somehow. I don't know. And so I'm not gloating about it. It hasn't been easy, but it has been a joy. And so we wanted to celebrate that they made it through that they had to go back to school in the public system. They, they came from it. They started out in it. And they're both going to enter into a TAFE course for assistance in nursing and, and from there move on into their life wherever God may lead them. One has a desire to head into the mission field and nurse. When that will happen, who knows? Another one, she's not so sure, but she understands that it's good to get a start in life and to have something behind you and go from there. And so I praise God and I was happy. But we were looking forward to celebrating this time and we never got there. Why didn't we get there? We were overtaken by some motorcycles, as they do, quite quickly. <laughs> and, and they were just enjoying their day and they were heading home only to find when we finally caught up with them, which you often do when people overtake you and decide that speeding is better than obeying by the road rules, <laughs> just putting that out there, you're fooling yourself. You've got no idea how many times I've had good brethren overtake me because they're running late to get to church and they feel the responsibility of doing things, get it set up, and I'll pull up behind them at the traffic lights. Mm-hmm. I think to myself, what did that achieve? This disgrace God's name. But I'll tell you now, when we caught up with him, this man had crashed his motorbike. Mm-hmm. And straight away, guess what the thought was in my mind? There you go. But it wasn't. It wasn't the case. I don't even know if he was still speeding by then. They had disappeared into the distance. But what had happened was another vehicle was coming the other way. And as our roads are in this shire, they're a bit of a mixed bag. Mm. Some are beautiful. They're only two days old. (coughs) (laughs) And the rest are terrible. Mm -hmm. And we're thankful that we have well-suspended cars, right? We bought a truck recently and it wasn't so well-suspended in the cab, mostly because it was worn out from the rough roads, I think. We put some new shockies in and it's a much better truck to drive. But nonetheless, this vehicle, he was towing a trailer, and on the trailer was a whole bunch of stuff, which included four tyres, at least, Mm. with rims. And it seems as though, as the story goes, that they had started to come loose because of the rough roads and bouncing this trailer, and the man has 
almost like an emergency brake. He's pulled to the side and tried to pull up. But as he's pulled up, off came the tyre. Mm. One bounced straight into the motorcycle. Mm. The point of this story is, though, is what we found when we were there was this man lying in the ditch by this stage after his tumble in agony, in pain. Mm-hmm. 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 Now, <coughs> we went to see what we could do to assist, and, and you know, naturally, a lot of people were already on the phone calling the ambulance. And uh, I've had no first aid training since I was 18. I don't care to tell you how long ago that was. Less than some and more than others. <coughs> but my wife has recently had some first aid training and she started to assess the situation. But while we were about to begin, and I was talking with him, trying to calm him down, which he eventually did start to calm down, another lady turned up and said she was the first responder for the ambulance and she was da da And Nicole mentioned that she noted that she didn't really do what she thought she should have done as a first responder. She didn't check him over, she just sort of sat there trying to reassure him. In fact, at one stage she was going to pull his helmet off, mm-hmm. which I knew that much, you don't do that. Mm-hmm. We didn't see the accident, we don't know how we landed, we don't know anything. Now he had bits of hide missing off him everywhere. Mm-hmm. But the biggest concern was for the whole internal bleeding. Mm-hmm. He was complaining about pain, but the cell lady didn't want to check it over. She was so busy trying to reassure him he was going to be okay, she might have missed something crucially important that could be life-threatening. Mm-hmm. And that's what Christianity is about. Mm-hmm. We're busy looking on the outside. And we're a fairly conservative church here. Praise God for that. I'm not about boo-hoo conservativeness. We are to represent Christ, are we not? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just the outside that we see. Where are we going on the inside? How are we doing here? Are we truly growing? Are we with the Lord in our daily practice? Are we seeking Him earnestly? Or are we busy dressing up the outside hoping that the inside won't really cause us that much harm? And what's worse then is when people come along and say, that's okay. You look up. You go to church. You pray. It doesn't matter if you're doing this thing that the Word says you shouldn't do it. Don't worry about that. You look the part. I'm here to challenge us all. It's not about looking the part. It's about living the life. Jesus wants our life. Not so he can destroy it like the devil. So he can give it even more abundantly to us. What are the things we're seeking after? Are we seeking after eternity or a moment's pleasure? Are we seeking after our brothers and our sisters, Christ's purchased possession out there that are lost, unawares of what's about to take place on this earth? Hearts failing them for fear, yet no idea of what's about to happen. That are about to be caught up, hook, line and sinker in this whole global warming. Environmental crisis. And so the lesson I learned, the object lesson I learned from that accident, we don't have to bash people over the head and tell them, hey, you're doing the wrong thing, that's not how the word says we should do it, but... We need to connect with people, encourage people, (coughs) challenge people. How are you walking with the Lord? Or are you just a hypocrite, as Jesus put it? What washed sepulchres with dead men's bones on the inside? The outer appearance looked good. In this man's case, it wasn't so good. He had skin missing and it was evident that he was in a lot of pain. Possibly smashed his lower leg, his left leg it was, at least his ankle. A lot of pain from his knee down and his left forearm. Man, that was scratched right down the bone. And not a little bit. 
でもそれは聞くとこがありますけどで稲穂焼きも味がやまちいいですよねうん合わないあってもいい Getting to know Jesus will do something powerful in your life, and I remember it happening. <clears throat> Jesus changed my life, and what I realized this morning was I was holding him back from finishing the work. Because I love sin. Oh, we can dress it up how we like. Even that which is good and ordained of God can be sin, can it not? You can take a whole table full of beautiful, healthy, nourishing food, the best organic, biodynamic, whatever you want to call it, eat it in its right forms, in its right order, and all the rest of it. Chew it the right amount of times, get plenty of saliva on it, get that digestion happening so it feeds the body well, and still sin by overeating and dumping the whole lot in the toilet. It's <laughs> <laughs> the truth. Same thing goes with Christianity. You can preach it, you can talk about it, you can do all you like, but unless you let it change the life, unless you start to live it, unless we reflect the character of Christ, not only will we be lost, but many that could have been changed with the knowledge that we have will be lost also. <clears throat> call a spade a spade, however you need to call it. Some people may need it more forcibly where they're at, others may need it more carefully. Delicately. But a spade should still be a spade. Don't try and call it something else. I saw a lady call it a spoon once. Well, it was technically a spoon, but it was a big one. <laughs> and you wouldn't have thought it by her appearance either. I was a little bit like, whoa, can you just put the whole thing in your mouth? <laughs> you know those big serving up spoons? Mm -hmm. She's such a lovely woman. And I still, I still really appreciate her as a woman. And we had a good joke about it. And she threatened me, don't you tell anyone. <laughs> so I won't mention her name, therefore I technically didn't tell anyone who she was and what she did, but she got this, she was dishing out, scratching out the last of the food, I think it was, I'm just trying to remember now, but anyway, she was cleaning up and there was a bit left on this spoon. And she offered it to me, I said, oh, it's, it's all good, thanks. Next, she just went, whoa. <laughs> and we're not talking a tablespoon, I'm talking about a serving up spoon, this thing, it was a shovel. <laughs> she shoved that whole thing in her mouth and cleaned it up, and I just went. And she just said, don't you tell anyone. <laughs> and so for those that might have guessed who it is, don't you tell anyone. <clears throat> All jokes aside, though, when we separate ourselves from God, he's the one that knows it first. As it was said this morning as we finish out the lesson, Warren said, the f what's what's the first? What was it headed again? First step. What's the first step on the slippery slope? It's the first step, right? Little bit, little bit by little bit. Ellen White tells us that no man comes to sudden ruin. Slowly and almost imperceptibly. That means it is noticeable. We're not completely deceived. And if we don't notice it, someone else might pick up on it and they're charged by the word of God to do something to reach their brother before it's too late. Isn't that correct? In all fearfulness of God. But nonetheless, how many of us are coming to the room without realising the true impact? There's another object lesson I want to share. Now it is very, very dry, is it not? <laughs> no, it's not. It's actually dry, isn't it? <clears throat> what is that? Frangipani. 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 Good, that's that's it. We can still recognize what it is, despite how terrible it probably feels right now. Who'd like to guess how long that's been off the tree? Yes, Yesterday. Yesterday, months. Some of us, from our knowledge of frangipanis, are probably guessing longer than 
sure because that sounds about right. Six months. But does it look like it? No. If you saw the rest of the tree, you probably wouldn't think that it had been off that long. That's why it's still beautiful. Mm -hmm. Those leaves are still, look at that. You can still bend them. Still, why? Still alive, but moisture. Still alive, you think? Yeah. Aren't we told that we get life from the root? Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any. How long has it been in the car? A week. Well, I noticed it, I only noticed it about a month ago. I've been watching for the last two weeks. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's been off the tree for a month. Mm -hmm. You don't think sin kills? It just takes time sometimes. Mm -hmm. But things going to end up there. It doesn't get planted back in the ground. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Almost as if just being plucked. With the French paddy, you can just leave it like that. Just put it. Yep. Stacked on in the ground. Oh, yep. not on in the ground. But Be like us as Christians. And it'll come. Yeah. God can graft us in. Second ground. Yeah. We have been separated by our sins, Isaiah 59, verse 2, from God. Isn't that correct? But we're not dead. By God's grace. By God's grace. Amen, brother. Why are we not dead? Because he's busy trying to graft this back in. Within this branch is the substance of life. But there's no longer a source beyond it. It's only a matter of time. If you are not connected to the source of life properly, you will die. You will perish. There are no two buts about it. Either you are connected to the source of life or you are on the road to destruction. Doesn't matter how good you dress it up. Doesn't matter if you press this thing to try and preserve it somehow. It doesn't matter. The sure fact is without life, nothing can survive. It's the same with a Christian. <coughs> it doesn't matter how good we put on a face, come Sabbath or any other day of the week, it's our hearts that make all the difference. Mm -hmm. If you still have a heart of stone, that thing is not going to pump any blood. What's in the blood? Mm -hmm. Life is in the blood. If you're not pumping life around your body, how long before it dies? Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Five minutes. That's longer than I would have thought. I've been told that if you cut certain crucial arteries and whatever veins, it's a see you later. I had someone else tell me either you just plug it. Well, that's my thought too. But they tell me that's not so easily done. I had an accident years ago where a piece of metal hit the inside of my knee here and ended up about two and a half inches up the back of my hamstring. Couldn't even straighten my leg to pull it out. Much to my wife's disgust. But I was going to go back to work like that. She said, uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, and you go and get it. Seem to. Some people just tough nuts to crap. But anyway, I give in on the grounds that I thought I was smart. Found out I wasn't. I said, Well, if you can get an appointment, because I, I was busy. I'm always busy. Praise God for the Sabbath. I said, If you can get an appointment, this was at lunchtime. And I'm thinking I need to milk this afternoon, or somebody has to milk this afternoon at the time we're bearing. And it's got to go to the desert driving, half an hour back. And they said, if you can give me an appointment by 12.30 or whatever it was, yeah, I'll go to the doctor. It was just on 12 or something. You know. So I was smart. My wife was so beautiful. She went straight inside. She got on the phone and she rang the uh, medical centre and said, can I get an appointment for my husband? Blah, blah, blah. And they said, yeah, you can be here at 12.30. <laughs> Wonderful. I had planned to go back and cut a whole heap more posts and load them on a truck and have the order ready to take down to the guy that already felt the pressure that I didn't have it ready. But I stuck by my word and I got in the car and we went. We had an x-ray and there it was. The bit of metal I couldn't find in my knee was there in the back of my leg. And we had an operation and we took it out. 
But I said it missed some really important little tube yeah. going down there that carries a little blood. I wouldn't know what's called. What's it? Could be. I don't know. That didn't get me trying. I just said it was really important. If that thing had been hit, that would have been, it would have lived. As it was, I lost a fair bit of blood. I thought it was hunger that was making me feel weak. It could have been the amount of blood that was on my leg. I headed home for lunch because I was feeling hungry and weak. Praise God. I was out in the timber with no phone, not even a UHM those days, on my own. 20 minutes drive in a hurry from the house. And walked in casually as though nothing was wrong, because to me there was nothing wrong. You see how easy we can be fooled into thinking that we're okay? But if you want to search your heart and study the word with a desire to learn your own condition, not to say, oh, I see you, he's bad, that guy, I see you, I've seen him doing that. No. A man should do what? Let's read on. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also, also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be builded. And the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by, and they shall say, this land that was desolate, it uh, is become like the Garden of Eden. Wow. I've been in some pretty places. I think I live in a pretty place. And I went to a place recently, and it was a real object lesson simply because of the, the conditions at the moment. Everything is this whole new colour, brown. And it's not just brown, it's like nothingness. You know, it's hard to even say there's a shade anymore. White and black are shades, isn't that right? I learned something at school. It was homeschool. I learned it from my kids, man. Right? <laughs> and, and things have become so brown and dried out and dead that they almost have no colour left. Isn't that amazing? And I went to look at this guy's job, he wanted a fencing job, and wanted me to quote on it. He had no idea who I was, until I got there. When I saw his name come up on the in invite on the internet, on a, on a app things that we that were um, described, subscribed to, I thought, I know that guy. <laughs> I'm going to go and see if I can help him out with his fence. And you drive around the road and everything's just, apart from the fact that there's irrigated fields along the way, and then we get to this guy's driveway and you drive down and, all, and you just sort of see this patch of trees. It's like this little oasis in this brown nothingness. And you can't see it, you can just see this like square. It's not perfectly square because the river cuts the corner off a little. And it's just, it's beautiful on the outside, but then you go in, you drive in through the gateway and, wow, he's only with the tank of that. He's only a kid. And he's just, everything is green. Everyone else is wondering if their mowers are going to start. He hasn't stopped using them. Everything, the, the grass is green. It's soft to walk on. It's like, wow. I just come from... And you can't see it. It's like he's in his own little Eden. You can't see out anywhere of what's going <clears> on. If he never went anywhere else, he'd be none the wiser that there was a drought going on. It's just beautiful. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to make the waste desolate. So what was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined <laughs> places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and it, and I will do it. Amen. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock, as the holy flock, as the flock of Jerusalem is in her solemn feasts. So shall the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, and they shall know that I am Lord. So will you take the time? Search your heart. 
That's my question. Will you commit your life fully to the Lord if it is not already? I'm not here to judge anyone. From what I found out as I studied and looked at things this morning, I'm in no place to judge anyone. I'm just here to share a message. There's no time left, people. There really isn't. Whatever pride you've got going on, whatever things you think are worthwhile of your time and energy, if they're not from the Lord, you are not. And if they are from the Lord and you're using it to excess, give it up. Bring it back to its rightful place. Don't let it be a rule or a God over you. Men's hearts are failing them with fear. The article I read says that in May the Pope has called a meeting. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of very, very influential people are going to be there. That's next year. That's like six months away. That meeting's going to, it's going to have some real implications as to how we know life now, I believe. Because there are, if you read these quotes that they've been saying, and, and once again, it sort of just slips the view of most people because it's not out on, guess what? The general media, right? So most people that aren't looking for these things aren't seeing it, but they're saying it just the same. The meetings are happening just the same. And that's the whole point. It's going to come on us as a thief. Because if you're not prepared to stand before that time comes, it's going to be hard pressed getting ready. In time. And people found that out with fire, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Fires were lost because they weren't as ready as they thought they were. Places were lost because they didn't realise how unprepared they were. They didn't realise how close or how threatening the situation was. I'm here to tell you, <clears throat> it's time to wake up. Not for our own sakes, but for God's. He doesn't want to lose anyone. He's long suffering that none should perish. Mm -hmm. But all should come to repentance and have last thing on the earth. Will we repent? Will we turn from whatever it is that's holding us back? God says He'll finish the work. But you know the thing that really just amazes me? I understand a fraction of how powerful God is. I have seen His work. And yet all that power can be put at a stop by the will of man. Do you know that? Because he loves us, he won't force us. Not one way or another. He will compel us. He will plead with us. He will bring us to circumstances of almost breaking <clears throat> point through our own decisions. But he will never force us. If we say no, I will not give that up. He will respect <clears throat> all the power that he holds in his hand will be stayed by that decision. That's why the cross can't change God. His law is part of his character. The righteousness of his character had to be vindicated. So many things tied up in the cross, but it all comes back to the simple fact <coughs> sin requires payment. Mm -hmm. God said, I'll give it that they may have life. Mm -hmm. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so loving and merciful, that you are long-suffering and not impatient and impulsive as we are, but that you will forbear with man as long as forbearance can withstand sin. I pray, dear Father in heaven, that every person here, wherever they may even be, if they're listening in another time, will take this message seriously. You are pleading, not only with your people, but with the rest of this world. The very work that we are to do, Father, that we're leaving undone, will be finished by somebody. Those faithful few will finish this work. 
under the injunction of the Holy Spirit, they will go forward and proclaim the last message of warning to this earth. I pray that we be amongst that faithful few. That we will glorify Jesus and that Jesus will be finally lifted up as he is meant to be, that all men that be willing will be drawn unto him. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.